Hi, I'm Rachel and this is my Author's Answer video for August 2022. The Author's Answer series was started by author tuber J.D. Archer and his writing group, uh, wherein they asked themselves a variety of reading and writing related questions. Uh, it started out on his blog, and then he posted a handful of these, uh, you know, answers to his author tube page. So I'll link all that information down below. I have been answering these questions one per month for the past several years, uh, and I am up to question number 65 which is uh, to talk about how you would convince someone to read the genre you write in. <laughs> I usually have a pretty easy time, I think, rambling a quick answer off uh, in uh, author's answer, uh, but this one I feel like uh, took a little more work, and that's part of the reason why uh, I'm getting this video out a <laughs> little bit later than I uh, hoped to. Uh, I'll probably still ramble, but I... Uh, felt the need to do a little more research than usual, uh, especially because um, technically I write in more than one genre. So I started thinking about, you know, uh, I've published a few literary short stories and I'm also uh, trying to write a fantasy novel. And so it's like that never the two shall meet place uh, between uh, literary fiction and uh, genre fiction, well, specifically science fiction or fantasy or fantasy in my case. Uh, and I feel like that's a good uh, jumping off point uh, to say uh, why people can read widely. And I think uh, it comes down to the fact that there's such a variety of subgenres uh, that uh, even if you think on the, on the surface that uh, you would never find anything interesting like in a short story, a literary short story or something, or never find anything interesting in a, like a high... Uh, drama mainstream fantasy that there's a lot going on <laughs> in both uh, so I mean for example like you could start with uh, literary short stories uh, you know you have most conventional I guess top tier uh, publishing uh, maybe doesn't take as many risks but as tried and true like in you know, long-standing journals like you know some of the university presses like the Georgia Review uh, but then there's always constant uh, smaller presses uh, coming out that tend to be sometimes more experimental or stuff like that, or even just moving beyond those vague terms. You know, s there's so many literary journals out there. Some uh, cater toward uh, longer short stories that are like very detailed, like I was uh, reading a collection by Kirsten Valdez Quaid earlier in the year, which they felt like uh, like uh, almost like novels and in fact she turned one of them into a novel it was uh, that detailed that much potential but another form that's uh, really popular these days is like microfiction and flash fiction and stories that are like uh, you know a thousand or even a hundred words long and you know you can especially find those in online uh, literary journals uh, for free and I also thought I'd put in here that, of course, uh, science fiction and fantasy also has a uh, short story uh, component that, in fact, I think the genre was uh, built first on short stories. And there's some tried and true, uh, conventional in a way, science fiction and fantasy uh, short story journals like Asimov's, things like that. Uh, but then, much like uh, with uh, literary journals, there's, you know, uh, more... I guess homegrown ones, newer ones, could be more experimental. Figured I'd uh, also uh, put in a plug for, I guess, uh, speculative short story collections because uh, I finally went ahead and uh, wrote my first one, uh, a dystopian uh, short story, which I recently uh, submitted to an anthology call. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But then on to novels and all of the subgenres therein. Uh, I think literary fiction is mostly known for being very long and stuffy and dramatic and serious. So uh, in that uh, vein, I recently read uh, Barkskins by Annie Prue, which, uh, you know, is very sprawling, probably not for somebody who's just tr wanting to try out the genre, but it's uh, multi-generational. It speaks to uh, very... Uh, complicated serious themes about the environment and about human history. But literary fiction can also be short and biting and funny like this other book I recently read, And the Bride Closed the Door by Ronit Madelon, translated by Jessica Cohen. And this is really very much a slice of life. It's a satire of sorts where the uh, 
bride-to-be on her wedding day uh, closes herself into her room and uh, the, her family goes to extreme lengths, uh, getting into hilarious lengths to try to get her out. And uh, from there, there can be a little bit of commentary, I think, about Israeli society that comes out of uh, these exploits. But it's mostly very short and, in fact, uh, very funny, which <laughs> I think people forget uh, some literary fiction can be funny. <laughs> I do think, and maybe uh, people would disagree with me, that there's a certain amount of thoughtfulness to uh, literary fiction that... One thing that it can't be is uh, trashy. I mean, there's bad literary fiction that's out there, but it can't be conventionally trashy, like uh, books that are solely meant to titillate you in some way, sexually or otherwise. Uh, literary fiction uh, takes uh, the idea of, uh, you know, thoughtful themes and characters a little too seriously for that, I think, even in, you know, comic ones. Uh, but there is such a thing as a uh, trashy literature, including with uh, mainstream realist uh, fiction, I think, uh, and certainly in genre fiction. Uh, and I figured I would bring this up uh, because uh, there is a readathon going on right now, uh, which is called the Garb August re readathon for reading garbage in August. It's uh, it's run by Criminali, so I'll link to his video down below. He also has a lot of uh, uh, fellow co-hosts. Uh, but anyway, uh, the whole point is uh, to read uh, trash literature. And he had a list of uh, uh, examples uh, that he linked to in his video. So I thought I'd start by uh, talking about, you know, a sort of, I guess, uh, general mainstream book that's trashy, uh, Flowers in the Attic by V.C. Andrews. Uh, these are... Uh, it's the start of a series. It's kind of gothic where uh, this family with sort of salacious ties to begin with uh, moves back to uh, the mother's uh, uh, old uh, home, uh, Foxworth Hall, which is, you know, stately and has all this uh, past history associated with it. And she's trying to make good with her parents because her, her husband just died. Uh, but her marriage was very salacious, and uh, there was incest, <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, she goes and uh, locks her children in an attic to try to make a fresh start for herself, so there's, you know, uh, that sort of melodrama going on, and uh, also uh, there's uh, more uh, incest to be had with uh, the children uh, in the attic. It, I mean, it's just sort of, I think, uh, not meant to be serious about these issues. It's really meant to titillate. And uh, that's what makes it uh, trashy. Uh, he also uh, pointed to a uh, science fiction book uh, that was in fact written by the uh, founder of Scientology. I haven't read it. It's Battlefield Earth by L. Ron Hubbard. I believe it was made into a very uh, panned movie as well. So uh, this I believe would be considered trashy because it's incredibly one-dimensional. It's sort of a uh, post-apocalyptic novel, but it's really just all about, you know, uh, cardboard figures sort of duking it out and that sort of thing. So you're just supposed to be titillated by uh, the action uh, of it all, is uh, my understanding anyway. Uh, but yeah, it's, you know, still it's popular to maybe uh, p get lost in that sort of pure escapism of uh, just turning your mind off and enjoying uh, the spectacle of it all. Uh, and in that vein, I figured I'd end with uh, I, what I think is uh, some trashy uh, fantasy. Uh, this is a little more, I guess, controversial, but I think of the Sarah J. Moss books uh, that are popular now. Uh, they're generally considered to be a bit trashy, uh, I think because uh, they lean hard on uh, the sex and romance aspects to it. Uh, uh, and uh, perhaps are more dramatic than uh, thought out, but uh, I know it's kind of complicated to talk about Sarah J. Mass and trash because uh, I think her fans uh, are a little uh, more divided on whether she's trashy or not. And maybe part of that has to do with uh, how much they've fallen for her characters. Uh, I think another part might be about to push for, especially uh, YA, which Sarah J. Moss sort of is sometimes, to be more like uh, socially relevant and thoughtful in that arena. Uh, and I also think part of it has to do with the fact that uh, women aren't respected as much for writing trash in a way. I mean, uh, they're, they're pilloried for, you know, their female characters and uh, their female concerns. It's kind of like how women's fiction is a 
category rather than just putting into it into literary fiction. Uh, we can't, uh, people don't compare it with a respect to the trashy stuff written by men. So uh, I think uh, there's that divide as well. So I don't know, those are just sort of my thoughts about it. But uh, I think a lot of people read Sarah J. Moss and uh, admit that they like the titillation of uh, the uh, steamy relationships or maybe some of the fantastical elements that aren't as uh, probably not as well developed. But uh, I admit I actually haven't read her either. But if you don't want trashy literature, but still want to try out science fiction and fantasy, I think there's a lot that's available that uh, is, in fact, very well crafted in terms of uh, world building or characters or themes that are explored or, or better written, perhaps, than, than the, the uh, trashy books, although I think sometimes those are intentionally bad, badly written. Uh, but, uh, for example, uh, to stick with, uh, with fantasy, uh, Fantasy has two major camps, uh, generally speaking, in terms of setting. Either uh, it is uh, epic fantasy, in t and that would usually translate to uh, secondary world fantasy. It's uh, something that takes place in a completely different world, sometimes with uh, non-human characters even. Uh, or urban fantasy, which takes place in our world, and there's a lot that might be uh, realist, but then we're following a subset of, uh, like, a vampire coven or, you know, kind of a portal fantasy, like with Hogwarts, you know, uh, being hidden in plain sight in a way, that sort of thing. So, uh, both of these uh, suggestions are pretty high on uh, world building as well, uh, like for... Uh, Urban fantasy, I was thinking of the Sookie Stackhouse novels, and there's like a lot of, uh, you know, past history in them, like that uh, the author uh, builds up uh, her society as of vampires and fae and uh, all that sort of stuff, but it in fact takes place uh, in Louisiana. Uh, and uh, then there's like a secondary world uh, fantasy, like the Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin, which technically might be far, 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 far future Earth, but it's so vastly different than what it is now that it might as well be another planet entirely, where um, there are seismic uh, seasons and shifts between the seasons, and uh, sometimes uh, these uh, very dangerous weather patterns are controlled by a class of people who have a magical ability to do so. So uh, there's a lot of uh, world building in that one as well. And it also uh, does touch upon themes of prejudice and sort of uh, forced class systems and labor systems, uh, which can uh, be compared in a way to our real life issues of today. But if you'd like a fantasy perhaps with more minimal world building where you could uh, focus more on characters that largely remind you of realist characters, I was thinking perhaps of uh, The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, which is a gothic ghost story that takes place on this uh, spooky manor with a governess. So I think a lot of people who uh, like uh, that sort of uh, gothic realist fiction can, you know, step easily into a story where there is a component of, uh, is there a ghost? Isn't there a ghost? Uh, how are we influenced uh, by the specters of our past? <laughs> uh, maybe I'm going too much into it. Uh, there's also uh, science fiction and fantasy, uh, which uh, really hews a lot closer to uh, reality. Uh, I think there's a big push about uh, sort of dystopian or post-apocalyptic uh, choices uh, that uh, nevertheless, uh, there's no magic to them, uh, well, usually, but uh, that uh, it could kind of take place tomorrow with a couple of tweaks about uh, environmental disaster. But uh, like Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, uh, is speculative and kind of sci-fi, but only because it imagines the world 20 years after a devastating flu wiped us out. Uh, but other than that, uh, Station Eleven certainly imagines like a very altered uh, Earth experience, but in a lot of ways it's uh, recognizable as well because uh, there the focus is like on a traveling Shakespeare company uh, and uh, there's no, it's not a book about like advanced technology at all or space travel or that sort of stuff, uh, which uh, is another uh, subgenre of science fiction that can really branch out in different directions. Like for example, uh, 
the Expanse novels by James S. A. Corey are about uh, spacefaring like a few gener uh, centuries into the future, uh, and it also gets deeply into socioeconomic and political themes, but it relies heavily on hard science fiction, so that a lot of uh, the scientific storytelling is very much based on fact. Uh, versus perhaps the Interdependency series by John Scalzi, which is also technically science fiction and spacefaring, but uh, the, me the systems of travel and that sort of thing are not scientifically sound, so in that way it's arguably fant fantastical as well. Uh, but uh, both of those are really sort of space operas because uh, their primary focus, I think, is on drama in space. <laughs> uh, then uh, another... Uh, option for science. There, there's other options for science fiction, for example. We have uh, Parallel Worlds and the Space Between the Worlds by Micaiah Johnson, which is about uh, a future uh, Earth society that uh, finds a way to jump between dimensions uh, and uh, sends people sort of to mine research resources on other Earths. And so that also gets into political and socioeconomic themes about uh, exploitation uh, and class and race. Uh, and uh, another near future sort of uh, low on uh, huge amounts of world building example I can think of is uh, We Are Satellites by Sarah Pinksker, which takes place in the near future on Earth. And it imagines a new technology that's sort of meant to uh, hone uh, productivity and focus uh, for people uh, and uh, the effects that uh, has on our brains having this technology implanted and then the effects it has on society as there's like this growing distance between people who have the implant and people who don't. And finally to return to fantasy with very minimal world building I would think is The Book of M by Peng Shepard which is perhaps com comparable to Station Eleven because it's uh, dystopian and imagines uh, a world where people are slowly dying away, uh, but uh, it happens because uh, their shadows magically disappear and then they lose their memories. So again, this is not at all based in any verifiable science, but it's a uh, basically a gimmick to try to understand how uh, the survivors try to keep society going. So you don't have to get too lost in the whys of it all, uh, but uh, I think uh, I personally love a lot of uh, world building in my science fiction and fantasy, uh, but that's not for everybody. <laughs> so there we have it, all this extra time I did to do a little bit of research, and I still feel like it came out as a uh, ungainly ramble, but my thesis basically, hope, <laughs> which hopefully is supported, is that there's just so much variety in all of these genres, and short stories, and literary, and SFF, that uh, my major impetus would be, you know, if you want to try something in, a, in you know, any of these particular areas, uh, there's a lot to choose from, so don't just assume everything's the same and off limits to you. So that's uh, my attempt at any push for marketing, because <laughs> uh, I get, feel like this question perhaps is uh, supposed to be a stab at uh, trying to market your own book, which would be necessary if you want to get it published. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure how I did on that front, uh, but hopefully uh, you got some interesting book recs along the way, which I'll uh, link down below. So that about covers it for me now. Uh, I feel like I'm very pressed for time, but it's been a difficult <laughs> week for me. 2022 has been rather difficult. It's kind of been problem after problem after problem, and alas, uh, my cat's uh, medical issues have uh, kind of come back. <laughs> so there's that. I, 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 uh, I'm a bit distracted, but I also, you know, enjoy taking part uh, in BookTube uh, as a way to uh, celebrate uh, reading and writing even as uh, other things are going as well. So I do hope to be here imminently to do a very belated first AM reading video of the month, uh, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, everyone, thanks so much for watching, keep writing, and I'll see you next time.